I actually have no positive words. I think things are only going to get worse. Uh, I, I don't think most people understand how much trouble we're in. Uh, it, 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 as I tried to make clear, I think the Russians will win in Ukraine. Uh, I think this will have uh, negative consequences for Europe. It'll do significant damage to NATO. Uh, I think that nationalism is a growing force around the world. Uh, I think the liberal regimes that dominated during the unipolar moment in Europe uh, are in trouble. I think if you look at the American domestic political situation, uh, especially with regard to what's happening with Donald Trump and how he thinks about democracy, I think it's quite clear that the United States is in trouble. With regard to the Middle East, I think the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is uh, only going to get worse. The idea that the Israelis are in the process of fixing this problem, I don't think is true. There's no solution to Gaza at the moment. Hello, everybody. My name is Paul Buitink, and welcome to a new episode of the Reinvent Money podcast. Today's guest is renowned American scholar, author, and one of the most quoted academics when it comes to international relations, John Mersheimer of the University of Chicago. Welcome, John. Glad to be here, Paul. I'm honored and grateful for you to appear in my show. So thanks so much for, for making time available for me. Um, I look forward to discussing... Uh, sorry? My pleasure. Yeah. I look forward to discussing geopolitics with you, uh, with a focus on the role of the European Union, uh, where I'm based. I'm based in the Netherlands. Um, you've developed this theory of offensive realism in international relations. Could you first of all describe what offensive realism is? Yeah, let me describe what realism is and then contrast it with the way most economists and business people think. Realism is a theory about how the world works that focuses on power. And it says that states compete among themselves for power. In other words, they worry greatly about the balance of power and they want to make sure they're more powerful than all their potential rivals. Now, why do I argue that states think that way? The key is that in international politics, there is no higher authority. In the international system, there's no night watchman, no institution or state that states can turn to if they get into trouble. Uh, and because you can never know the intentions of other states, and you are sometimes dealing with really powerful states, what you have to do is make sure that you can protect yourself. It's a self-help world because again, there's no higher authority that can rescue if you get into trouble. If there's a state out there that has malign intentions towards you and is also very powerful. So this logic applies to all states in the system. They all understand that they should be powerful, but because power is basically a zero sum phenomenon, states end up competing for power with each other. And sometimes that security competition turns to war. Now, people in the world of finance, uh, economic uh, scholars or scholars of economics, they don't focus on the fact that the world is anarchic, that there's no higher authority, and that there is this ever-present threat of war. What they're interested in doing is maximizing prosperity. They're interested in competing economically, doing deals, trading with other countries, investing in other countries so that they can promote wealth. This makes perfect sense from an economic point of view, but there's no attention paid to security issues. There's no attention paid to the fact that you live in a world where there's no higher authority and some other state may attack you, which gives you incentives to be really powerful. So you have this one logic, realism, that focuses on the importance of trying to survive in a system where there's no higher authority and where power matters. And then you have economists and business people who don't pay attention to those considerations and instead just worry about how to get rich. Uh, 
And those are two very different ways of thinking about the world. Yeah, but at the same time, as a, as a businessman, I would also like to get stronger and take market share from my competitor. And if there, if I see an opportunity or if I can uh, make use of a vulnerability, then I would also do that as a, as a company. So in that sense, there are some similarities uh, between how uh, states operate and our businesses operate. Yes, there's no question in both logics, let's call it the economic logic and the realist logic. In both logics, there's a lot of competition. But survival has a completely different meaning in the realist conception, right? For survival, you're talking about another state attacking you and doing significant damage to you, maybe even eliminating you. In the world of economics, survival has a very different meaning. Your company may be bought by another company, uh, you may go bankrupt, but you're not thinking about your survival the way states think about their survival. You're thinking about prosperity, you're thinking about getting richer, and that's a fundamentally different way of thinking about the world. And I would argue, and this is where the rubber really hits the road, I would argue if those two logics are in conflict, you will privilege the realist logic because survival is the most important goal of any state. Because if you don't survive, you can't prosper. So yeah. what I'm saying here is that realist logic in the end is what matters most. And every nation, every nation wants to be a regional hegemon now. That's one of the um, foundations of, of your theory that as a, as a hegemon, you want to be, or as a country, you want to basically accumulate power and become a regional uh, hegemon if possible um yeah, then, my argument. yeah and if you then look at the european union for example which is not a state it's a bit of a hybrid structure of of nation states that work together and it becomes increasingly uh like a super state or like a political union but how uh, would the european union be seen in this framework well my realist framework focuses on states and argues that states are the principal actors in the system. And there's no question that states can get together and they can form institutions like the European Union or NATO. And those institutions are very important for their foreign policy. And if you look at Europe today, you have a set of institutions, and here we're talking mainly about the EU and NATO, which are probably two of the most successful institutions in the history of the world. So what's happened is that all of these European states have come together and they act in concert to some extent, or maybe we could say to a large extent in terms of farm formulating a collective foreign policy. But the key point to always keep in mind is that collective European foreign policy is driven in large part by Europe's relationship with the United States. And basically, Europeans have accepted a world in which the United States provides security for European states. And in return, the Europeans basically do what the United States wants them to do in the realm of foreign policy. So when you talk about this concept of Europe, right, it's very important to understand that Europe does not have an independent foreign policy. Some of that is due to the fact that Europe is comprised of independent states, but more importantly, Europe does not have an independent foreign policy because it is beholden to the United States. The United States provides security for Europe mainly through NATO. And the quid pro quo is that the Europeans do what the Americans want them to do. And in my opinion, this is ultimately not a very healthy situation. No. So um, ideally, Europe starts forming their own foreign policy. Um, but even without the US, could you argue that it makes sense for the European Union to expand towards Georgia, um, uh, Ukraine, etc., because that's in line with with offensive realism, where they want to expand and become a more dominant regional uh, hegemon? No, I don't think so. I don't think Europe could ever become a regional hegemon, uh, certainly without the United States. 
The United States is, in very important ways, the glue that holds Europe together. Most people don't understand this. But if you took away the United States from Europe, let's say we put an end to NATO. There's no more NATO, no more American military commitment to Europe. The Europeans would be on their own. Countries like Germany would have to provide security for themselves because the United States would not be there with its security umbrella over Germany. And if Germany was providing security for itself, this would not make the Netherlands very happy. It would not make France or Poland very happy. So it would not be a good situation. And this, of course, is why European countries like the idea of having the United States in Europe. It's why European states love NATO, because the American security umbrella prevents European countries from competing with each other for security. And they can instead focus on getting rich because the Americans are providing security. But the problem is, as I said before, is that you then become, you Europeans become beholden to the United States and you have to do things that the Americans want you to do. And by the way, NATO expansion into Ukraine is a perfect example of this. When that decision was made in April 2008, uh, both Angela Merkel and uh, Sarkozy, uh, who was the French president at the time, were opposed to NATO expansion into Ukraine. They believed that it would lead to disaster. Of course, they were correct. But the Americans insisted on NATO expansion into Ukraine. The Europeans caved in, as almost always happens. And the end result is we have this disaster today. So if the Europeans collectively had been more powerful and had been able to stand up to the Americans and say expansion of NATO into Ukraine is a fundamentally bad idea, uh, Europe would not be in all the trouble that it's in today. But it's a huge dilemma then. On the one hand, you need the US to uh, basically be the great pacifier in this, in this uh, region and make sure that we're not going to fight amongst ourselves, they provide a security blanket, but at the same time, uh, their policies are not always in line with, with our, uh, what should be our own ideal policy. So are you saying then we should try to uh, slowly but surely be strong enough to have our, and formulate our own foreign policy? But that means we would need to unite even more. And there's just so much uh, differences within Europe, culturally, linguistically, economically. Is it even possible to become this strong united Europe at all? I agree completely with what you say. It, it, as I alluded to before, uh, if the Europeans push the Americans away and try to develop, let's call it a European foreign policy, what will happen is that Europe will fracture and you'll get each state formulating its own foreign policy. You won't have a European foreign policy. So the Europeans are in this terrible situation where they have to basically follow the dictates of the United States to keep the Americans in Europe. But it means uh, basically, like if you look at the Ukraine, if that escalates further, then uh, it could be um, uh, devastating for the continent. So it's, it's, it's a dilemma. What's then the, the ideal uh, solution here? Stay in NATO, keep on following the US, or in the end, try to break away from the, from the US and, and NATO? There's no good solution. I do not believe it's in Europe's interest to break away from the United States. I believe that the European countries have a deep-seated interest in keeping the American security umbrella over their heads. Uh, but at the same time, I think the Europeans should go to greater lengths to push back when the right. Americans have what I would call strategically foolish ideas. Uh, I think it would have made a lot of sense if the French and the Germans and other European countries had pushed back on NATO expansion uh, and had gone to greater lengths to get the Americans to settle uh, the Ukraine war uh, much earlier. Uh, I mean, after it started. Uh, but the Europeans didn't push back. The Europeans followed uh, the Americans. They followed the Pied Piper. And... Uh, The end result is that the Russians are going to win in Ukraine, and this is going to have really negative consequences for NATO and for Europe more generally. What kind of consequences? Well, the fact is that NATO has 
put its reputation on the line. Uh, and if uh, the Russians win and Ukraine loses, this is going to be a devastating defeat for NATO. And it's going to weaken the alliance. And you want to remember, as we've talked about a little bit earlier, there are important disputes and fracture lines inside of Europe. The French and the Germans, for example, are very angry with each other today because of uh, Macron's talk about putting French troops in Ukraine. The Germans were outraged by his pronouncement. And you have all sorts of cleavages in Europe. Uh, Hungary is another example. Viktor Orban talks in ways that make many other European countries very angry. He, of course, is angry at those countries. So there are all these cleavages in Europe that are right below the surface. And if NATO were to suffer a humiliating defeat in Ukraine, these uh, cleavages would be exacerbated. And furthermore, Europeans would begin to question the transatlantic relationship. They'd be questioning America's judgment, America's ability to protect them more and more. And this would not be a good thing. So I think there'll be significant negative consequences once it becomes clear that uh, Ukraine has been a failure, which it has been. And, and could one of those negative consequences be that um, Russia smells the West is weak and he would continue invading other countries? Because I, I listened to Mike Johnson earlier today, the Speaker of, uh, of, of the House in, uh, in the US, who said that we really need to support Ukraine more because he has intel or, or, or his agencies say that Putin would definitely um, continue attack Poland, attack the Baltics. I heard. I also hear that constantly in the Dutch media that there's intel available saying that Russia would make those next moves. Could that be one of the consequences? No, this is a myth that's been created in the West uh, to uh, generate support uh, for continuing to aid Ukraine. The fact is, in the United States and even in Europe, but especially in the United States. A lot of people have come to the conclusion that supporting Ukraine in this war is pointless, if not counterproductive. And the Biden administration is having a huge problem getting this uh, aid for Ukraine through Congress. So what the United States and its European allies, and of course, this includes the Netherlands, is doing is engaging in threat inflation. Uh, and they're making an argument that the Russians are the second coming of the Soviet Union or the second coming of Nazi Germany. And uh, if we don't stop them in Ukraine, they're pretty soon going to be conquering all of Eastern Europe. Then they'll conquer Central and Western Europe. And before you know it, they'll be on the beaches at Dunkirk and this will be the end of the world. This is nonsense. The Russians don't have the military capability or the interest in even conquering all of Ukraine. It's just very important to understand that. People talk about the Russians conquering countries beyond Ukraine. There's no evidence that the Russians are interested in conquering all of Ukraine. And when people talk about secret intelligence, I've been in this business long enough to know that if there were intelligence that showed the Russians we're interested in conquering countries in Eastern Europe or in Western Europe, real intelligence, that it would have been leaked by now. It hasn't been leaked by now, and we don't see any evidence of it because it doesn't exist. This is sounds, good old yeah. threat inflation. It sounds a bit like the weapons of mass destruction uh, that were supposed to be in, uh, in Iraq. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But then, if uh, with uh, according to your framework, um, Russia would like to grow its its hegemon status in in this area of, in this region of the world. So um, maybe a small attack into the Baltics or trying to form a land bridge between Russia, and Belarusia, and and, and uh, Lithuania and Kaliningrad would fall within your theory. Then, right? No, because Russia is not powerful enough to become a hegemon. Look, every country in an ideal world would like to be a hegemon. Every country would like to be in a situation similar to the one that the United States is in in the Western Hemisphere. The United States is a regional hegemon in the Western Hemisphere. 
We are so powerful that no country in the Western Hemisphere would ever think about attacking us. That's the ideal situation. The Netherlands wishes it could be in that position. Poland wishes it could be in that position. And I believe Russia wishes it could be in that position. But none of those states have the capability to be a regional hegemon. So Russia is not going to try to conquer territory in Europe to become a regional hegemon because it doesn't have the capability. Now, you talk about the possibility it may attack a country in, uh, let's say, a small country in Eastern Europe, one of the Baltic states. The problem here is the Baltic states are in NATO. And if the Russians attack a Baltic state, be it Lithuania, Latvia, or Estonia, they're attacking a state in NATO. Uh, these states have an Article 5 guarantee, and the Russians will end up in all likelihood in a war with the United States and more generally with NATO. This would be remarkably foolish. This is why the Russians have never shown any interest in trying to conquer a Baltic state. The Russians have been primarily interested in one thing, making sure that Ukraine does not become part of NATO. They're not interested in conquering countries in Eastern Europe. Uh, they have been there, they have done that, and it did not work out very well. The Russians, after 1989, were very happy to get out of Eastern Europe. Occupying and managing Eastern Europe was a nightmare. They had to invade Hungary in 1956. They had to invade Czechoslovakia in 1968. They had to put down an insurrection in East Germany in 1953. They had to deal with countries like Romania and Albania that gave them constant headaches. The Russians understand that occupying people who don't want you to run their politics is going to lead to insurrection. It's going to lead to trouble. It's more trouble than it's worth. The Russians have no interest, in my opinion, in conquering other countries. And in, uh, in 1993 already, you said that uh, Ukraine should not give up their nuclear weapons because having nukes is, of course, uh, the best deterrent you can have. Um, would you say the Netherlands, for example, should also um, have their own nuclear capability? Because we live in such an uncertain time where we can question maybe NATO's future. We can question the future of the continent. Would Holland be strategically smart if we would also acquire our own nuclear capabilities? No. Uh, and you want to ask yourself two questions when you think about this issue. First of all, what's the threat to the Netherlands uh, that would justify getting nuclear weapons? And number two, how would the United States react? Uh, because we all know the United States is deeply opposed to nuclear proliferation. There is no serious threat to the Netherlands. The only real threat to the Netherlands is the foolish foreign policy that the Netherlands pursues. Uh, and, and this is in large part because the Netherlands is part of the EU and it's part of NATO. And the Netherlands has joined. Uh, onto this crusade where uh, we're pushing both NATO and the EU eastward, uh, especially into Ukraine, and threatening the Russians. Uh, the Netherlands got themselves in trouble with the Russians by following the Pied Piper, also known as the United States. Uh, but the idea that Russia is a direct threat to the Netherlands and that having nuclear weapons would be good for the Netherlands, I don't think that's true at all. And then my second point is the United States uh, would go to enormous lengths to punish the Netherlands if it tried to acquire nuclear weapons. So there is no good reason for the Netherlands to go down the nuclear road, in my opinion. Clear answer. Okay. Uh, what about the future of the European Union? Do you believe it? Do you believe it? It makes sense to keep on expanding, or uh, because I, I start to form this belief that it makes more sense to break it up in smaller unions that have more in common culturally, linguistically, economically. For example, you could have a Latin Union, a Slavic Union, Nordic Union, maybe German-Dutch Union, um, because now it becomes this Tower of Babel where, um, where the interests are so uh, uh, not aligned, um, yet they keep on expanding and expanding, I think at some point until they reach a, a, a breaking point. But what, what's your view on the European Union and its, its viability, its future? I think, first of all, the European Union should stop expanding and should definitely not expand into places like Ukraine 
and Belarus. Uh, second point I would make is that um, uh, I think the European Union's future depends in large part on what happens to NATO. Most people in Europe don't realize this, but the reason the European has been so successful is because of NATO. NATO provides security. It, in effect, takes the security issue off the table, and it allows the European Union to operate in ways where the states in the EU can maximize their prosperity. It's what we were talking at the very beginning of our conversation about, right? There's a security logic and an economic logic, and the security logic is taken care of by NATO. NATO provides security for Europe. It takes security issues basically off the table. Unt and until it doesn't, off. right? Pardon? Uh, no, until it doesn't. Let's say Trump uh, gets um, uh, gets the, the the presidency again, and he already said, "Yeah, well, let's let's first see if every uh, NATO nation uh, will uh, pay up uh, and and make sure to invest enough. Otherwise, uh, they can um, they can mind their own business." Um, but sorry, you can continue. But I, I feel like uh, maybe we were depending a bit too much on on the security blanket, and now when push comes to shove, it turns out we are we are naked. We have no more, or we have a few weapons. Uh, uh, we have a neighbor that is militarily mighty at the moment, uh, and and the US could just potentially drop us. So we are quite vulnerable at the moment. Well, I think there is a possibility. I, I believe it's a, it's a small possibility that if Trump is elected, that he could put an end to NATO uh, or he could weaken it to the point where it just didn't matter. Uh, I think that that possibility exists. Uh, and I think the Europeans would be in trouble, not so much because of the Russian threat. Again, I think the idea that the Netherlands faces this great Russian threat is simply not true. The real problem that Europe faces in a world where NATO disappears is that the European states would have to provide for their own security and they would compete with each other. The Germans and the French, the Germans and the Poles, that's what would happen. The Netherlands would think differently about Germany in a world where there's no NATO. The reason that the Netherlands is very happy about NATO's existence and does not want NATO to go away. And this is the reason that people in the Netherlands and people in Europe more generally fear Trump so much, is that they understand that NATO and the American military presence or the American pacifier in Europe take security competition among European countries off the table. So that's the real threat here. I, I don't think there's a threat of Russia dominating Europe. Clear. And um, the, the, the great uh, conflict you, you worried about or to something that's potentially, uh, of course, much more important than what's going on in Ukraine is, is the showdown between uh, China on the one hand and, and the US on the other hand. Um, if, if we would stop um, supplying arms to Ukraine, uh, is there a chance that, that China thinks, OK, the West is weak, uh, they're not uh, willing and able to help out Ukraine, so uh, we might as well just uh, take our chances with Taiwan? No, I, I don't think that logic works. Uh, First of all, I think the Chinese understand full well that we will defend Taiwan. Joe Biden has said it four separate times. He has said that we will defend Taiwan. Uh, in February of this year, we permanently stationed American ground forces in Taiwan. Very important to understand this. We now have a contingent of ground forces permanently stationed in Taiwan. So we will defend Taiwan. Uh, and whether or not the Chinese attack is a function of whether they think they can conquer Taiwan at some reasonable cost. And my view is for the foreseeable future, uh, they can't do that. Uh, that the United States, the Japanese, the Australians, uh, and the Taiwanese together uh, would make the uh, Chinese pay an awful price if they tried to conquer Taiwan. So I think that regardless of what happens in Ukraine, uh, the Chinese are likely to believe that it does not make sense to invade Taiwan. And, and um, in, in Ukraine, do you, do you believe uh, Russia is uh, 
is aligning all their actions with 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 China is is how far can Russia go um, in, for in, in China's view? Are there red lines uh, for for China? Can, can you say anything about that? No, I think Russia is a sovereign state. It believes that NATO expansion into Ukraine is an existential threat. I know people in the West, uh, and that includes the Netherlands, refuse to believe this, uh, but they're wrong. The Russians do view it as an existential threat, and what the Russians think is what matters. And given that they believe, the Russians, that they're facing an existential threat in Ukraine, uh, they will do whatever they think as a sovereign nation is necessary to provide for their security. This is basic realist logic at play. And uh, I don't think that China has much influence on what Russia does. Now, there's no question that the Russians uh, want economic and diplomatic support from China. And there's no question that the Chinese have been giving the Russians that economic and diplomatic support. In fact, what we, and here I'm talking about the West, has done is driven the Russians and the Chinese together. They are now the best of friends. They are helping each other out because of our foolish policies regarding NATO expansion and EU expansion into Ukraine. Uh, but this does not mean that China has coercive leverage over Russia and that the Chinese can push the Russians around. That's not what's happening here. The Russians, again, are a sovereign state with a lot of military power that believes it is facing or they are facing an existential threat and they will act accordingly. Yeah. And then the other conflict um, in the Middle East, of course, uh, last weekend, uh, we saw a further escalation in the conflict between uh, Israel and, and Iran in this, in this case. Um, we record this on Thursday, the 18th of April. Um, it will be uh, published as soon as possible, hopefully uh, on the same day. What, what do you expect um, Israel's uh, next step to be? It's actually quite difficult to say. Uh, if you sort of study carefully what the Israelis are saying, there are a number of Israeli policymakers who would like to uh, lash back at Iran and attack the Iranian homeland. Uh, at the same time, there are a number of policymakers uh, inside of Israel who don't want to do that. And of course, the Americans do not want them to attack uh, Iran's homeland either, because the end result will be that Iran will retaliate uh, and we will go up the escalation ladder. And it's hard to tell a story where there's a happy ending if uh, Iran and Israel go up the escalation ladder. So there are powerful incentives uh, for Israel not to attack uh, Iranian territory. I think the Israelis have to retaliate. And I think that the retaliation in all likelihood will not be against the Iranian homeland or if it is, it'll be a rather small attack. Uh, but uh, it's very hard to say exactly how this will play itself out because the Israelis are so wedded to the idea of escalation dominance. You have to understand that from the very beginning of the founding of the state in 1948, the Israelis have believed that their security depended on escalation dominance. Anytime there was an exchange with an adversary, the Israelis had to come out on top. And if the Israelis do not retaliate in a meaningful way, or let's put it differently, in a hard hitting way against Iran, then they don't have escalation dominance. But the problem is if they do retaliate in a hard hitting way, uh, the Iranians will retaliate and the Israelis will not end up with escalation dominance. Right? What I'm saying here is that I think escalation dominance, which is so important uh, for Israeli thinking about how best to survive in the Middle East, has in a very important way been taken off the table with regard to Iran. But again, this creates powerful incentives among some Israelis to think 
we have to find a way to reestablish escalation dominance. So we have to attack Iran and just hope that they don't retaliate in a meaningful way. Uh, but again, there are people who are on the other side of this debate. And this is why it's just very hard to say what the Israelis will do. Yeah. Well, you could also argue that the military industrial complex uh, wouldn't mind if this uh, war escalates and it becomes a big conflict with the U.S. involved as well. I don't think that's true. Uh, I, I don't. I think the there may be some people in the military industrial complex who would like a bigger war. Uh, but I think the uh, uh, I think the Biden administration uh, will go to enormous lengths uh, to try to prevent uh, this war between Iran and Israel from escalating. It's just not in our interest. And of course, it's not in Israel's or Iran's interest anyway. Uh, and in terms of the military industrial complex, they're doing perfectly fine these days anyway. Uh, we've generated so many wars around the world. And even if they're not wars, countries need lots of armaments and uh, they're making lots of money. Uh, so they don't need a major war, especially since we're talking about a lot of countries here that have nuclear weapons. I mean, you want yeah. to remember the United States, Russia and China all have nuclear weapons. So when we talk about a possible war over Taiwan involving the United States and China, we're talking about countries that have nuclear weapons. And one can tell a story, I think it's highly unlikely, where Iran and Israel start retaliating each, against each other. The Americans get pulled in on the Israeli side and the Russians get pulled in on the, the Iranian side. And you have the Iranians and the Russians fighting against the Israelis and the Americans. And again, in that case, you would have three out of the four countries as nuclear weapon states. Uh, yeah, so maybe that. that's even for the military industrial complex, even that is too much then. I would also say that they, but like you said, they're, they're in a way already benefiting so much from what's going on. And if, if there's too many wars, they probably can't keep up with their production anyway, right? So. <laughs> that's certainly true in Ukraine. Uh, yeah. we, 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 we can't produce the necessary weapons for Ukraine. You know, there's all this talk about the importance of getting this aid package through Congress. Uh, even if the aid package gets through Congress, the fact is we don't have the weapons that the Ukrainians need uh, because the industrial base in the United States, and, it, and this is true in Europe as well, the European industrial bases and the American industrial base cannot produce the weapons that the, uh, the Ukrainians need. And we can give them lots of dollars and lots of euros, but you can't fight a war with dollars and euros. You need weapons. Yeah. And, uh, and, but, and deterrence is, uh, nuclear weapons can be a good deterrence, but at the same time, Israel has them and Iran doesn't seem to be impressed by uh, um, Israel having these weapons. So how come it's not a deterrent uh, in, in this case then? Well, because the Iranians have limited their attacks on Israel. Uh, you can tell a story where the Iranians launch a massive attack against Israel, do huge amounts of damage, and in the process, attack Israel's nuclear reactor at Dimona. And the end result is that all sorts of radiation uh, spews out of this badly damaged reactor. And in that scenario, the Israelis retaliate with nuclear weapons. Uh, is that likely? No because both the Iranians and the Israelis understand that's a road that they don't want to go down. But escalation is a tricky business, you know, and sometimes you get out there on the slippery slope and you can't control events uh, and things escalate in ways that you did not anticipate. So I would say to you, Paul, if the, if the Israelis retaliate against the Iranians in a serious way, uh, which they might, I don't think it's likely, but they might, and the Iranians then retaliate again against Israel, it's a much larger strike. You're beginning to creep up to that point where you may hit Demona, where you may do so much damage in Israel that you prompt a massive response. And one can hypothesize plausible, not likely, but plausible scenarios where nuclear weapons are used. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and that would be awful, of course, uh, if we would ever reach that, reach that point. Uh, 
Uh, but I can imagine if uh, if you're a rational actor, you would keep that in mind and you would not um, escalate that far. But could we assume that Ayatollahs are are rational actors uh, or that they're fundamentalists? Maybe they would see that as the ultimate price they would be willing to pay is uh, to die as martyrs? I don't believe that at all. Uh, I, I believe if anybody is likely to act recklessly, it's the Israelis, not the Iranians. Very important to understand here. You don't hear this in a country like the Netherlands because you're so heavily propagandized there. But uh, the Iranians did not want a war between Iran and Israel or Iran and the United States. And the United States does not want a war between Israel and Iran or a war between Iran and the United States. So the Iranians and the Americans have no interest in this conflict that's now taking place. This conflict was initiated by the Israelis. They started it when they bombed the Iranian uh, consulate uh, in uh, Damascus, period. As a, as a response, of course, to what they thought were um, uh, generals of Iran talking to Hezbollah and, and perhaps plot another attack. So in, in, their, in their view, it was self-defense. I, you can make arguments like that, but in my opinion, that's an argument that uh, belies common sense, right? Uh, if, if, you, if you go after the consulate or the embassy of another country uh, and you destroy the building and you kill seven people, two of whom are uh, important generals, uh, you're asking for the other side to retaliate. You know what the consequences are going to be. The Israelis understood that there would be some retaliation, uh, I believe, and uh, they started this. This is not to say that Iran and Israel didn't have bad relations. And this is not to say that the Israelis were not at the time, this is April 1st, when the Israelis attacked the Iranian consulate. This is not to say that the Iranians uh, and the Israelis didn't have terrible relations and that the Israelis weren't fighting against Hezbollah, which is allied with Israel. But Hezbollah is, which is allied with Iran, excuse me. But Hezbollah is not Iran. And Iran made it clear it did not want a war with Israel. The Israelis knew that. So the Israelis purposely provoked them. Yeah, and they informed the U.S. one day in advance, I believe. So, so Biden was uh, only informed at the very last moment that they would strike that consulate. Uh, so uh, that, I think, uh, proves the point that the U.S. is absolutely not um, uh, um, happy with, uh, with this escalation going on. I've not seen evidence of that, uh, that, that we were warned. Uh, my, my understanding, and I'm not saying I'm wrong, you may be right, but my understanding is we were not told about it. And after it happened, we were very upset. And we told the Israelis in no uncertain terms never to do that again, never to attack without informing us beforehand. But I don't think, Paul, that they told us because if they had told us, we would have told them not to do it and put great pressure on them not to do it. This is a remarkably provocative move. And by the way, I believe the Israelis did it in good part to get us sucked into the war. Right. I believe yeah. the Israelis are deeply committed to getting us sucked into the war. And as I said before, Joe Biden does not want to get involved in a war with Iran. He wants to stay out. And the Iranians want to stay out. It's the Israelis who are behind this. Of course, you can't say that in the West, because in the West, you have to say that the Iranians are responsible for all of this. They're the font of all evil. And uh, it's the Israelis and the Americans and their European allies who are the good guys. But this is a fairy tale that we invent. Uh, we invented uh, to protect Israel. Uh, the fact is the Israelis are the cause of this conflict. Well, um, let's, let's go to the final topic, uh, because I know we are running out of time, but I would long, like to pick your brain uh, too on, on the, um, the world financial system. And the dollar at the moment is the dominant uh, world reverse reserve currency. Um, we've changed about, uh, we talked about a changing world order. Um, let's say uh, China, India, Russia, BRICS uh, become more powerful the coming years and the West's influence will will fade. What do you believe uh, will be the, the, the fate of the dollar over the coming, let's say, 10 years? 
Well, let me just preface my comments by saying you should understand that when it comes to strategy and security, I'm an expert, but this is not my real area of expertise. Uh, I pay attention to it, but uh, uh, I, I don't study it the way I study security issues. Uh, I think that um, there are lots of countries around the world, especially in what we call the global south, uh, who would like to unseat the dollar. Uh, they don't like the idea that the dollar is the reserve currency. But there are two real big problems that uh, people face who want to unseat the dollar. One is the American economy is remarkably strong. Uh, it is a truly powerful and impressive uh, economy that doesn't seem to slow down very much at all. Uh, and secondly, what currency is going to replace the dollar? Uh, you know, some people have said in the past the euro, but if you look at what's happening to the EU, uh, there's no reason to think the EU is getting stronger and stronger and the euro can replace the dollar. Uh, and then if you look at BRICS countries, uh, there's no currency there uh, that can replace the dollar. Uh, and if you look closely at relations between countries inside the BRICS, uh, there are significant cleavages there as well. There have been a whole spate of articles recently on relations between Modi and Xi, and more generally relations between the Chinese and the Indians. And uh, relations between those two countries are not good. I was in India last month. I was in Delhi. And uh, it's very clear that the Indians live in fear of the Chinese uh, going on the offensive up in the Himalaya mountains because there's an intense border dispute between the two countries. Uh, and then there are differences between the two countries uh, that are likely to manifest themselves over the Indian Ocean. You know, the Chinese are building a blue water navy and they're interested in projecting power into the Persian Gulf. And that means they have to go, the Chinese have to go through the Indian Ocean with that blue water navy. This does not make the Indians happy. So if you just look at Indian Chinese relations, uh, there's cause for concern there. Uh, so I'm just saying that I don't think the BRICS are gonna get together and produce a currency that can in any meaningful way replace the dollar. So I think the dollar, uh, as best I can tell, will be the world's reserve currency moving forward. Okay, well, that's a very clear analysis. Uh, so thanks so much, uh, John. Maybe um, final uh, remark from your end, so maybe also to give people at home some some uh, comfort or, or hope because there's just so many things going on, so many conflicts. I know a lot of people that are really stressed out because of everything that's going on in the world right now. Uh, perhaps some some positive words from your end to uh, to close the conversation with? I actually have no positive words. I think things are only going to get worse. Uh, I, I don't think most people understand how much trouble we're in. Uh, it, 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 as I tried to make clear, I think the Russians will win in Ukraine. Uh, I think this will have uh, negative consequences for Europe. It'll do significant damage to NATO. Uh, I think that nationalism is a growing force around the world. Uh, I think the liberal regimes that dominated during the unipolar moment uh, in Europe uh, are in trouble. I think if you look at the American domestic political situation, uh, especially with regard to what's happening with Donald Trump and how he thinks about democracy, I think it's quite clear that the United States is in trouble. With regard to the Middle East, I think the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is uh, only going to get worse. The idea that the Israelis are in the process of fixing this problem, I don't think is true. There's no solution to Gaza at the moment. Uh, the Israelis are in real trouble with regard to Hamas and with regard to Hezbollah and with regard to what's happening on the West Bank. You and I have talked here today about the Israeli-Iranian conflict. It's hard to see that one settling down. Uh, if anything, it's likely to remain a major problem moving forward. Uh, the Americans, of course, are joined at the hip with the Israelis, and the Israelis are in a position where they can drag us into all sorts of conflicts. Uh, and the Europeans, because they basically uh, 
uh, do whatever the Israelis want, or are not in a position to put pressure on Israel to act more responsibly. The United States is not in a position to put pressure on Israel to act more responsibly. So the Middle East looks like a mess. Uh, Europe looks like a mess. And I think in many ways, the most dangerous situation, certainly from an American point of view, is East Asia and the possibility of a war between the United States and China. You raise the issue of Taiwan. I think it's more likely that we'll have a conflict over the South China Sea or the East China Sea. Uh, and then you go to the Korean Peninsula and you look at relations between North Korea and South Korea. Uh, and uh, that's not a pretty story either. So there are just so many ways we can get into trouble moving forward. And it's just hard to see how you fix any of these problems. Uh, and I would argue, Paul, that if there were simple solutions, or let's put it differently, if there were solutions, uh, feasible solutions, not simple solutions, feasible solutions, you and I would have spent a lot of time talking about those feasible solutions. But the fact that you couldn't raise them and I couldn't raise them tells you they're just not out there. Yeah. So I think people ought to, you know, buckle in to their seat belts and understand that uh, going to be a lot of trouble moving forward. It's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Well, right. Yeah. Well, indeed, those are uh, very honest uh, remarks, uh, John. And I, I agree it's a, it's a gloomy world out there. Uh, but hopefully for our children and grandchildren, at some point we get better leaders that are able to navigate us out of this mess. But um, uh, it will not, won't happen anytime soon. Yes, yes. Okay, well, thanks so much for your time, John. I really appreciate it. And uh, I learned a lot. And, and hopefully we can do it again in the future. My pleasure, Paul. Thank you very much for having me.